Wonderful. We've got a presentation now on green, competitive and resilient times, in, in, uh, resilient in times of uncertainty. Dr. Carolos Papadas from the University of York's Management School. Thank you very much for, um, for saying yes to presenting. Over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, uh, and um, uh, thank you for the introduction. And thanks for, uh, I don't know if you can see me right now. Yes. And thanks for the introduction. And thanks uh, everyone for uh, making it and uh, being here today, finding some time to attend this uh, masterclass. Um, it's really good to know that we have uh, such a diverse audience with uh, colleagues, people from the industry, students. So, um, yes, when I designed this presentation, I designed in a way that it could be uh, actually adaptable to, to uh, a wider audience. So, um, yeah, this presentation is more like uh, my view of uh, an option that uh, businesses uh, and organizations may have in order to, um, uh, to address uncertainty, which tends to be the new normal. So, um, this presentation will actually take about 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes, and then I look forward to uh, the next part with the discussion to share our thoughts and uh, also receive some feedback from you from what you think about what I just said. So, just starting, as you can see here, uh, I don't know, yeah, as you can see here, um, this is, uh, these are two pictures. The one on the, uh, on the left is from the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. And uh, the other one is from the city of Wuhan in China. So someone would actually uh, try to think what could be the connection between these two places. Of course, I'm sure that you can guess uh, what's, uh, why the city of Wuhan is there and how it's related to the current situation. But I don't know if you can make any connection Still, uh, it was in faith that these two areas will be connected a few months ago. And the reason why these two areas are connected is because it was the Mount Iloan uh, volcano in Hawaii where Charles Killing first demonstrated the impact of the fossil fuel usage on atmospheric CO2 levels. So in practice, it was that place in Hawaii when we had the very first evidence um, that we have concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. And since we have this evidence, we have the so-called killing curve, which you can see that on your right. And you can see that unfortunately, this curve is rising and rising, which means that um, every year we're doing even worse in terms of the climate change. And the connection between Mauna Loa and um, the current pandemic we're all experiencing um, was made uh, a few months ago, back in spring, when for the first time the scientists there noticed that and were trying to find a change in the atmospheric CO2 emissions and concentrations due to the global economic slowdown caused by coronavirus. So it was the first time in history that they could see a change, a big change, in many cities. And that was also evidenced by some pictures as published from Financial Times. And you can see China and uh, the, the, the area, the air of China, how polluted it is before the lockdown. During the lockdown, the air is clear. And after the lockdown or the ease of the lockdown measures, again, we have some pollution. And that was the case in many cities and European cities like London, Milan, Paris. So you can see. Uh, that uh, these two areas were about to be connected and they were connected in that way. And since then, the lessons that we have learned and somehow facts that we, we, we could notice was that a huge global shock can reduce the CO2 emissions, which is a very uh, big environmental sustainability challenge. But of course, this, it will be much more preferable if we could achieve such a global shock in order to save our planet. What else we know is that the COVID-19 hit back with a second wave, unfortunately, and we can see what's happening around the world today. And what we still know is that the climate crisis remains the biggest global threat uh, still today. Um, 
So two, a couple of thoughts that someone can make is that the consequences of our actions can be collective and can have a big impact on our lives. And after all, COVID-19 and climate crisis share more or less a similar story. And the reason why they share a similar story is because it's outcome of the human behavior. And if you just have a closer look uh, at COVID-19, it's actually an outcome and it falls to the environmental sustainability issues we have today because it has been caused through the transfer of pathogens uh, from animals to people. So um, uh, this is an outcome of the human behavior and we, we, we must always remember that organizations also consist of human beings and people. And this brings us to one of the most popular words uh, today, the word of uncertainty. Um, and um, the COVID-19 health crisis resulted in a global economic recession, which is worse than the Great Depression of 1930s, and even worse, of course, uh, than the global financial crisis of 2008, also known as uh, the Great Recession. Um, following the recent uh, second wave, we are expecting uh, even more and even worse economic consequences. And of course, a full economic recovery is still unknown today. Uh, and what happens in cases like this one and in circumstances like this one, the length, the magnitude and the nature of such crises are often unpredictable. So we still don't know how long this crisis will uh, last and what will be the, the consequences, the further consequences on the economy. What we know also from previous recessions is that such economic meltdowns are, highly, are, are associated with periods of high uncertainty. And what concerns me the most is that meanwhile, the climate crisis and the wider environmental sustainability challenges uh, are overshadowed by the current global health crisis. Well, we have moved our attention to the COVID-19. At some extent, this is reasonable because global leaders uh, need to deal with one global issue at the, at the time, but still we need to remember uh, a few things about the climate crisis. So from my, uh, from my view, from my personal view, and uh, I have to say as an early career researcher, um, this looks like the greatest business challenge of our age. Um, I mean, answering a good equation, how can organizations survive a crisis, become competitive and resilient responsibly, uh, sounds like a very hard question to answer uh, and uh, looks like um, this uh, zigzag road um, e, uh, on Folengandros, a Greek, a beautiful Greek island, where in order to reach the edge of the hill, you need to make many turns to think again, but at least when you end up at the edge, uh, then the view uh, rewards you. So I just hope by the end of this presentation, um, what we are going to discuss to be at least a bit rewarding from uh, the zigzag um, way I will follow now according to um, the narrative of this presentation. So we're in a search of a responsible strategy towards competitiveness. And uh, what, is usually, what usually is happening is that managers often decrease investment in some resources in order to secure the necessary liquidity and adapt to the changing needs of customers. This is reasonable because um, we can understand that managers need to pay, uh, need to, to pay the, the employees, organizations need to uh, survive, uh, there are bills that need to be paid. However, this leads companies, uh, most of the times, to a focus on the short-term survival, avoiding investments in the long run. This also comes with some risks. Um, so the ideal situation for companies is to find a, a good balance between competitiveness and short-term disruptions in order to survive uh, not only during the recession, but also in the post-recession uh, period. So it's really crucial, and this is what we are searching. We are searching for holistic strategies in order to enable firms to adapt easily to the disrupting environment, as well as remain competitive. Uh, the good thing is that we have uh, learned a few things from previous recessions. So, um, uh, what we've seen and what we have uh, learned from previous recessions is that maintaining, at least maintaining or increasing the strategic investment in stakeholder relations and innovation 
seems to be an efficient strategic response to a crisis and seems to pay off during and post crisis. A good option that a good strategy that would address uh, this, um, uh, this challenge will be sustainability. And we've seen um, other, we've seen evidence from other empirical studies in, in the past uh, arguing that sustainability could be a potential antidote to a recession. Why? Because sustainability, it offers this external and internal stakeholder focus because sustainability tries takes pressures from external stakeholders like regulation bodies, government, but also needs to address internal stakeholder issues like the employees, uh, the shareholders. And at the same time, sustainability is a very big disruptor because it brings new products, it brings innovation. So it's a very good source of competitive advantage. So for example, uh, also in order to honor the circular economy theme uh, that um, is hosting me today, uh, companies that support innovative circular economy business models and develop um, a unique and successful strategy that could create competitive advantage through cost reduction and differentiation. And we know that there are business models in the circular economy that offer this uh, kind of outcomes, performance outcomes. Now, the question is, does this work during a recession? Again, evidence from the Great Recession of 2008 shows that companies like the General Electric, Microsoft, Starbucks, uh, which are, are still big companies, that the evidence for these big companies showed that uh, maintaining their investments in environmental sustainability uh, related programs paid off. So this is a very, that was a very good sign from the previous Great Recession of 2008 with regards to the role of sustainability in during a recession. There is a big however here, because competitors can easily imitate environmental sustainability programs, and in the long run, competitiveness declines, profitability can converge, and resilience may weaken. So this means that sustainability may not be a sufficient strategy standing its own um, to address uh, the question we posed. So we are looking for something more than that. We are looking for a responsible strategy towards competitiveness and resilience. And the reason why we are looking uh, for this is because responsible organizations strive to adopt a balanced approach to corporate sustainability and resilience while building a competitive future. And this is what we need. We, just, we don't just need today competitive organizations. We need organizations that are also resilient. Any prioritization at this stage between profitability and sustainability could become a double-edged sword for the, for the businesses because if we invest more than we can invest, this could have a boomerang effect. Uh, and I think that this debate is more pragmatic and relevant than ever today, aiming a fight we have against two um, uh, global crises, um, an economic one coming from the COVID-19, and a climate one coming from the global uh, warming. And as Paul Pullman, the ex-CEO of uh, Unilever said, we cannot choose between growth and sustainability. We must have both. So this makes things even trickier and the challenge even more interesting. Um, a green marketing strategy towards competitiveness and resilience. Could, could that be um, um, a good strategy to address this? What we know is that purpose-driven organizations create products and services that address environmental imperative while remaining competitive. So when there is purpose and profitability, there are companies that can balance well purpose and profitability and can remain competitive. And this approach is further enhanced during economic meltdowns because consumers tend to adopt more sustainable lifestyles, are thinking more reflectively about their lives, and are trying to see the essence behind the use of a product. And this is also very relevant today in, our, uh, in the case of uh, the pandemic. Uh, a recent global survey by Accenture confirmed this trend, and they've seen that consumers strived to uh, limit food waste shop more consciously and also buy more sustainable options. 
So this is something that rings a bell for the marketing managers of a company. Also, there is, a, there is recent empirical evidence that green marketing does pay off in terms of competitiveness and profitability. Uh, there have been recent empirical studies showing that, but also there are many studies showing the link, the positive link between green marketing and competitiveness. So, before answering and before trying to understand if green marketing can be an option for organizations, it's really important in brief to understand what does a green marketing strategy really mean in practice? Uh, a green marketing strategy um, is, in, is by nature a proactive green marketing strategy that addresses the environmental imperative. This means that we are trying to take initiatives and actions well in advance before we have to. And green marketing orientation is defined as the extent to which an organization engages across all levels of the marketing strategy, at the strategic, tactical, internal level, in order to holistically um, uh, offer a product to their audience. So, for example, at the strategic level, uh, a company that wants to be green marketing oriented can focus on eco-friendly product development, on uh, um, creating partnerships with environmentally certified businesses, on conducting market research of, consume, of green consumer segments, and also networking in environmental business network, which is very common practice. At the tactical level, simply by adapting the marketing mix to a greener context, positioning of greener brands, uh, pricing policies that offset uh, the carbon footprint, uh, paperless promotion, uh, green supply, a green supply chain approach, these actions will constitute a greener marketing mix. And finally, internal, internal training, um, like environmental trending, uh, encouraging employees to adopt a sustainable lifestyle and rewarding exceptional environmental behavior inside the organization uh, is a very important internal green marketing orientation. We, we have a plethora of uh, companies that uh, have achieved um, a green marketing orientation. Bodyshop, one of the uh, initiators of a green marketing strategy and Patagonia are well-known companies for their long-term commitment to uh, uh, green marketing. Innocent also has, um, which is a UK-based company, um, has um, uh, created um, a very interesting recycling programs and CSR policies uh, that are integrated in their strategy. And even SME compa SMEs companies, small, medium-sized companies like Fruitful Office, which again, a UK-based UK company, which offers uh, baskets of fruits for uh, businesses. Uh, they have a very nice and interesting policy in um, uh, returning uh, and offsetting the carbon footprints from their transportation um, in uh, other environmental actions. So this is more or less a brief idea of how green marketing strategy can work in practice. So based on what we just said, one could argue that environmental sustainability and marketing strategy can offer a combination which fortifies an organization during a recession and is hard for competitors to unlock. And the main reason why we, um, we, we pose this argument is because environmental sustainability is a big disruptor and source of innovation and competitive advantage. However, when combined with a marketing strategy or when a marketing strategy is integrating environmental and sustainability issues, then we have a very unique offer um, that is very hard to be unlocked um, from, from the competitors. And also, uh, this could mean that a holistic green marketing strategy approach uh, can be a significant driving force for sustainable competitiveness and resilience in unpredictable times. At this point, I would just uh, turn off a light because I guess that you will um, it will be hard to see me in a few minutes. Um, and here we have another zigzag, um, as I was telling you earlier on. Excuse me, because we have a very big trend. Unfortunately, uh, one of the easiest one of the easiest ways to cut budget in companies as previous uh, also research and practice has shown, is the decrease in marketing investment. 
uh, during these sessions. It's a, a very easy budget to cut, especially for small companies. However, uh, this can have a very big uh, boomerang effect because both research and practice again suggest that cuts in marketing budget intensify the negative effect of a recession um, on a company. So this makes things even more complicated because even if you want to invest in environmental sustainability programs, you may not invest in marketing strategy. So um, without combining those two areas, uh, what we're proposing, it cannot work. So we bear this in mind as well. Actually, bearing all of this in mind, we uh, moved to, um, we, we, uh, we conducted um, a research uh, about, to, in order to answer the question, what is actually the role of green marketing strategy in times of uncertainty? And based on all this reasoning and all these thoughts, if green marketing strategy pays off in terms of competitiveness and resilience. Um, managing uncertainty will be the new normal for many companies around the world and even for the next few years, uh, I think. Um, and um, we have many examples. We have the post-Brexit challenges right now. We have the U.S. protectionists, which might end or not after the January 2021. We have COVID-19, which still uh, its length is uh, unknown. We have a, a, an EU migrant crisis still happening at the EU borders today, even today. Um, so this new era stresses the importance of uh, getting comfortable with the situation of uncertainty and also uh, trying to understand the importance of creating a competitive advantage and resilience in, uh, in periods like this ones. Many studies are using uh, and trying to measure uncertainty with uh, indicators from the stock market or other objective indicators. However, we decided to use a natural context in order to um, investigate uh, uncertainty and the relationship that we just mentioned. And uh, back in 2015, I can, uh, I can uh, confirm that uh, the economic and social environment of Greece was very, very uncertain. So what we did was to conduct a cross-sectional survey to, two, to 245 companies across uh, five different industries, uh, both small, medium, and large companies, and to measure the green marketing competitiveness and resilience of these companies. The core research framework was actually to understand the effect of green marketing strategy on competitive advantage and how this relationship is actually intensified or not from the green marketing resources, which means this is the allocated budget for green marketing, and then how competitive advantage may have um, an effect on operational and financial resilience. The key findings of this research was that we found all these relationships positive, meaning that a green marketing strategy can have an effect on um, competitive advantage and competitive advantage in turn can have a positive effect on resilience. And um, uh, we've seen that we, we actually offered a new option, a new view for companies to adopt a balanced strategy between profit and purpose. So we came out with a, a key finding that green marketing strategy can actually be this balanced strategy. According to our findings, green marketing strategy represents a, a very good strategy toward this direction. It creates competitive advantage and it can improve resilience uh, during a recession. Um, just to share with you some figures about the context of Greece back then. Um, Greece back then experienced the deepest recession in its modern political history during the period of 2010 2014, and it was the hardest, hit, the hardest hit country from the Great Recession of 2008. Uh, the second reason why Greece was a very good case for that period, it was that we had an increasing number of green marketing policies emerged in 2010s, as the country had one of the worst records on CO2 emissions in the EU. Another good reason to study these relationships in the Greek, in the context of Greece, was that the commitment of the Greek governments to implement specific OECD environmental recommendations 
as part of the macroeconomic adjustments to IMF and ECB. And finally, back then, many companies, many domestic companies and multinational firms uh, based in Greece were increasing the adopted environmental management and marketing practices. Uh, the reason why I just put that abruptly into my presentation is because I just wanted really to justify why we picked Greece as a country. And also during uh, the, the period of 2010 and 2014, a few years before our study, the Greek economy hit a record low with an average GDP of minus 4.2% and an average unemployment level of 21%. So these were the main reasons why we used Greece as a context. What else we found, I'm returning back to this slide now, and sorry for this uh, uh, turnaround. What also we found out was that sustainability for many firms remains an important asset uh, for companies when experiencing a period of uncertainty. However, uh, its effect on firms' competitiveness and resilience is further supported when we have a green marketing strategy. So here the argument that sustainab environmental sustainability programs and a green marketing strategy together can work better um, uh, finds um, uh, actually confirmation through our study. Another thing that we um, uh, found through our study was that we captured for the first time the link between green marketing and resilience in times of, of uncertainty. And this has very interesting implications for managers about the role of a green marketing strategy in firm survival, uh, both during the crisis and also post-crisis. And um, very, another very interesting finding was that indeed, increasing the availability of green marketing resources boosts the effect of green marketing strategy on competitive advantage and also the impact on operational and financial resilience. And this means that uh, if we at least maintain or increase the investment in green market resources, firms perform better once the economy recovered. And this is what our results showed as well. Um, and the interplay between green strategy and resources is instrumental. So the combination of having an integrated, a holistic green marketing strategy, which is still active and running along with maintaining or increasing the, market, the green marketing budget, this is very important for the performance outcomes I mentioned earlier on. For example, maintaining the investment in R&D programs of green products or services during a recession can generate innovation capabilities and driving differentiation in a sustainable way. So uh, that's a good example for companies in, um, in the manufacturing industry, for example. Now, I would like to share with you a Another finding that we actually we transformed it in, um, in, a, in this visual way in order to capture a typology of the strategic responses of companies in terms of green marketing strategies amid uncertainty. So here, as you can see, we have two axes. We have the X with green marketing strategy low and high and green marketing resources low and high. And as you can see, we have four clusters, four groups of companies. Uh, we have the committers, and these companies are highly engaged in this strategy and present high availability of green marketing resources during a recession. So they still have a very, um, a, a very highly engaged green marketing strategy, and at the same time, they're increasing their marketing, uh, green marketing budget. On the other hand, we have non-believers uh, and these companies are low engaged in this strategy uh, and not investing at all in green marketing resources during a recession. We also have investors. Uh, investors um, um, are companies that are investing during crisis. Uh, they are low engaged in this strategy. However, they are investing in green marketing resources during the recession. And this is a very interesting cluster as well. And finally, we have the reluctance who are engaged in this strategy. However, uh, they are afraid of making, of allocating uh, more uh, green marketing resources during a recession. So they are not investing more um, during a crisis um, in uh, green marketing strategies. Before moving to the next slide, I would like also to share a note about this typology. 
Uh, first of all, we tested for the demographic profile of the two groups, and we found no significant differences between the characteristics of each group. So this means that the green behavior, the, the response, the strategic response of companies in terms of green marketing strategies uh, is not a matter of only large companies or, comp or of companies that um, are particularly functioning in a, in a specific sector. What we also see is that we, we've seen high scores for both competitiveness and resilience for the green committers who have, uh, and these committers have highly engaged marketing strategy and also increased green um, allocation of budget. And it was higher than uh, green non-believers and green reluctance. And also another interesting finding was that the green investors seem to perform worse than green committers, but better than reluctance and non-believers. So this also uh, opens a, a very interesting discussions with regard to the managerial implications of this typology. And speaking about that, um, the, what, what I'm asking people, what I'm asking friends uh, who are working in the industry is that what would we change and what would you change in a marketing strategy if you knew that the global pandemic was coming? So that's an interesting question because it sets the priorities for a business and it's interesting to know what are the priorities. And then the second question is that, should we start planning differently for managing resilience in a hotter world? I mean, we've seen that some things that look unlike uh, to, uh, to happen are actually happening. So should we start also uh, planning uh, for uh, the climate crisis, which is right in front of us? What we try to, to do with this survey, with this research, is to offer, as I said, an option. So we think that green marketing, what we believe is that green marketing can help managers to recapture the value offered to a customer in times of uncertainty and at the same time uh, not ignoring the environmental impact, which is happening right now in many organizations. Also, it's really important to understand that companies that embrace green marketing strategy, based on our findings, uh, are better able to survive and even thrive in the face of phenomenal events such as the COVID-19. Another interesting implication is that uh, using the typology we produced based on our findings, uh, what a company could do is to identify the type of green response they belong, uh, map out where their competitors stand in this typology and uh, their strategy, and then diagnose their potential for competitive advantage during the crisis and maybe consider whether they want to increase their investment in green marketing or increase their engagement in green marketing. So for instance, a company facing many green reluctance or green non-believers in their immediate competitive sphere, investment in green marketing strategy in crisis could be uh, more promising as a base for competitive advantage. And this is my uh, last slide. Again, uh, uh, this, uh, this study and this survey um, came, na came naturally as a research question, but still I think that there is still much space to confirm these findings and also do this um, um, uh, survey in other contexts as well. But I think it's a very good um, uh, initiator for a discussion and later on. But what we need to keep um, is uh, as academics, as students, as managers, is that events we once consider unlikely, such as climate crisis, have high predictability, uh, if not in terms of their timing, certainly in terms of their impact. And scientists warn about this. Another thing that we need to bear in mind is that future crises will be probably as consequential as COVID-19 and even more significant. And I would like just um, um, to end up with a personal note. Um, during the last, I mean, since 2010, uh, as a person, I have experienced three different uncertainties. The first one was in Greece uh, during my PhD studies uh, between 2010 and 2015. And 
back then we had the Eurozone crisis with Greece and the bailout program. So it was um, a very uncertain, as I said, economic and social environment. Then I moved to um, UK in 2016, I think a few days after um, the Brexit referendum. So since then, I'm always hearing about Brexit challenges. So I still feel that uh, there is an uncertain environment I live in. And finally, this one, the, the environment that we all experiencing. And what I have actually figured out, and uh, always humbly speaking, and from my view, is that the source of crisis might be different each time. I mean, in these last 10 years, the source of all these crises were different as I, as I viewed them. Uh, yet the symptoms of the, of, the, of the economy are similar. So uh, from my perspective, we don't have an excuse um, for not being prepared for what's going to happen in the future, in the future crisis. And that's Hippocrates, the, the father of medicine, uh, once said, um, prevention is better than cure. So we better be ready. And I'm sure that we'll be ready. And I'm sure that uh, uh, we will definitely make it. And we will definitely, uh, and that's why we're here to discuss, um, uh, do brainstorming and also suggest options for organizations um, and always not forget that organizations consist of people and the outcome of our actions are immediate. Uh, thank you so much. I think I don't have any other slide. Thank you so much for, um, for listening to me. I hope I didn't uh, pass over the time. Uh, I'm just coming back to, um, to Peter uh, um, uh, and I'm very happy to um, discuss, uh, ask many questions you may wish and just think um, out loud for uh, the remaining time. Peter? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. That was, that was great. Um, and uh, so great that you have generated a huge number of questions, um, mm -hmm. some very difficult questions. Um, I'm going to, I'm really gonna start at the top. There's, there's a, a very popular one that people have, have upvoted. Um, so the, um, the, the first one um, is how can consumers be sure that companies are not just greenwashing their products and services? A very good question. I think I'm getting this question the last uh, five, six years. Uh, another main problem that makes things very complicated is greenwashing. There are many companies that uh, they are not walking the talk. Uh, they are not uh, making the translating their words into actions. I think that um, it is more obvious today than it was like 10 years ago, whether a company uh, is greenwashing or not, just because we have better access to information, we more or less uh, can access sources of information that verify the green behavior of companies. Um, authenticity, authenticity, honesty, and transparency are three key principles that we need to look out for companies that claim that are green oriented. And uh, this is also what I'm doing as a consumer. I'm trying to understand if the communication from the company that is coming out is authentic, transparent, uh, and honest. And um, the main challenge here, and um, what I need also to share with you is that usually, if not, you know, the, sometimes it's always the standard case, the CSR programs and the CSR uh, department usually is accommodated and also with next to the communications department. So sometimes the messages that are getting out of the departments of communication or public relations are not in the right way. So yes, what I have to say is that the consumers need to filter very well the information they're receiving, but at the same time, I'm very confident, I'm very confident for companies that are truly green marketing oriented because what they are doing, it can uh, be provided always with some evidence. Hope that answers the question. Uh, thank you. There's, um, th there's so many questions, I'm not gonna be able to get through them all. Um, if you want to uh, take your, uh, stop the slideshow, then- uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Full screen. Let me um, just, let's see. Stop. So I'm stop sharing, right? Yeah. 
and that will give you a bit of a rest before the next question. Um, the, the, the legality um, of, of prioritization. Um, mm -hmm. So Rachel is asking, how can sustainability be squared against profit when shareholder value is enshrined as a fundamental legal concept? Yeah, true. So um, this uh, uh, also, yeah, this falls, I think, the category of governance of a company. Um, there are still many things that need to be done in order to this to be um, uh, more uh, formalized in companies, and there are still things that need to be uh, to be done. Um, I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, I cannot give you a full answer on this, but from what I'm hearing from people who are working in strategy, um, we need to move to um, um, the, the shareholder, um, the stakeholder capitalism, which is a more sustainable way in order to um, create sustainable business organizations. Sorry, I cannot give you a, a more complete answer on this. Okay, and I've, uh, thank you. And I've just spotted a question about your definition. What, what, what do you, I, I won't read the whole question now, but um, I'll summarize it as what, what do you mean by sustainability? Sustainability um, is based on the triple bottom line. So this means that in order to be um, an organization to be sustainable, it should be responsible, uh, uh, in, it, should, da, da, it should do responsible actions in the economy for the local economy or the economy and have a positive impact on the economy to, um, uh, to take also into consideration social justice and communities and society. And the third pillar of sustainability uh, is the environmental sustainability uh, challenges. And environmental sustainability is a very big category and maybe the most important category because uh, under the or under of this uh, under this category, we have uh, climate crisis. We have the loss of biodiversity. Um, we have um, health crisis like COVID nineteen. So the triple bottom line actually defines what sustainability is. I'm going to ask you a, a, another question, and I'm, I'm taking it. Quite a few of these are coming through as the trade offs. Um, so, the, so the next one from um, Louise is, if companies are pursuing a green marketing strategy and aims to create a profit, how do we know for certain this will help the environment in, in the long term? Yeah, uh, again, it goes back to, uh, to the transparency. Um, a firm that has a holistic green marketing strategy, which means that there are many things that are happening in the background and not just on the shelves or in the front, um, uh, in the front um, of, of a shop um, speaks from, from their actions. So companies speak based on their actions. So this means that um, you will get specific environmental reports about how they're trying to reduce their carbon footprint. You can get uh, about the trade-offs that they are doing in their product development. Uh, for example, there are, there are quite a few, I will say, companies in the cosmetics industry I know that they are refusing to get in the hair color products. This is a very difficult decision for cosmetics companies because hair color products is very profitable. So this means that if an organization really means to have a green marketing strategy, uh, this will be so. Um, and back to the link of green marketing and performance, uh, there, are, there is evidence, both from research and practice, that it does pay off in competitiveness uh, and profitability, um, either in profitability through the competitive advantage, through cost reduction and differentiation, or even with, um, um, in terms of operational performance, the products, costs, innovation, and so on. Thank you. And, and I'm going to drop down the, the, the question list. Um, and I'm, I'm fir first of all going to ask um, a question about, again about definitions so we all know what we're talking about here and, and, and different people understanding different language. What, um, the, the next question is what approaches fall under green marketing? So when, when is it advertising um, and what are the other sides? Of, of, of green? So this, uh, yeah, this, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, this has to do first with the, mis the misconception between marketing and advertising. Many people confuse and think that marketing is identical to advertising. 
So green advertising is the easy way to show that you are green. And this very often uh, takes us to greenwashing cases. A green marketing strategy means that you have an integrated strategy that targets, that has long-term initiatives, short, medium, term um, actions and also internal activities. So this means that you are designing a strategy for a five year long time in order to have strategic green marketing activity in, uh, initiatives like green marketing research to know um, what the green consumer segments want. As I said, to join environmental business networks, to have um, very specific high quality standards, environmental standards for your partners. So that's the strategic level. The tactical level deals with the marketing mix, a greener product, a greener, a greener pricing policy that can offset carbon footprint, for example, uh, promotion, paperless promotion, digital communication, and supply chain management and green supply chain, which is a very big thing, uh, a very big issue for many companies about how they manage their logistics. Uh, and finally, at an internal level, environmental training of our employees uh, because the first people we need to convince about our green marketing strategy and our environmental sustainability programs are our employees. So environmental training, rewarding the environmental behavior, um, and um, sometimes environmental, internal environmental awards. This is what is happening more or less in practice in, on an average in organizations. So I've tried to sum up many green marketing strategies across all levels. Thank you, and, and, and that leads nicely into the next question. Um, there's a question of how do you define a high level of green marketing resource? Is the answer to that question exactly what you've just said about all the activities? Or did you, um, I'm guessing behind there is, is are there metrics to, to, to measure? Uh, we, have, we haven't specified what this could mean. So the question we asked to these companies was according and based on your needs, based on your size, based on your um, uh, performance objectives, uh, tell us how much did you increase or not during that period, the, your allocated green marketing budget. So again, it depends on the company. Um, we have many cases of SMEs that they are doing great by investing in some small green marketing actions. Uh, we have many great companies that are investing in the long term for the next 10 years in strategic green marketing actions. Okay. I'm, I'm aware that we, we normally say that we want to end at around about 10 2. You've got so many questions coming up. Is it okay to carry on for a little bit? Very little bit? carry on. I, I, and just, I would like just to thank everyone who asks questions. And if they don't get the time, their question to be answered, I'm more than happy to send me an email or contact me through LinkedIn. Thank you very much, because there are so many and, and they are really, really interesting, challenging questions. I'm, I'm going to ask them, uh, the, the next two um, together. Um, so the, the first one um, is, would you encourage companies to align their strategy to the, the UN development goals? And then in answering that, are you answering it in large company context or small company context as well? Because there's that challenge for those those SMEs um, that uh, of, of how they do it at the same time as trying to survive. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. I think uh, this is a very good question as well. I, I was um, I participated today in um, a conference with a keynote speaker, uh, the Professor Sachs, who who's actually uh, one of the persons who designed the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Large companies can, of course, I think. The best strategy is companies to understand that they cannot solve all and address all the issues of sustainability. So what I would suggest to companies is that uh, all managers is to pick a relevant sustainability develop, sustainable development goal that they think that is relevant to their business and just stick to it. If they have the resources, if they are large companies, they try to link and, and tie the sector of their organization with a specific sustainable development goal, if that makes sense. For smaller companies, again, we have very good cases of companies that they are trying just to, to do something little, but still very important. So supporting your local community uh, in terms of CSR more, or um, 
trying to um, engage in activities and environmental activities locally could do the job and could provide a very good uh, um, strategy for these companies. And still, adapting your, green mar your marketing mix to a greener version is feasible for any company, I guess, at some extent. I've still got loads of questions to ask you. Let's, let's carry on. Carry on. But the first one um, uh, is going to be a double question. Is um, yeah. first one from Stephen? Can you name a, a company um, that has sufficient transparency and undertakes a sufficient activity to be labelled as truly sustainable? So that's the first part of the question. I'm going to give you a little time to think about that. And if if you have got a name of a company for that, what about a name for a company that does alliances? So that has, has, has pursued this area through alliances. So the first one is, can you name or have you worked with a company that's truly sustainable? The, the, the first company that comes to my mind is Unilever. And this is because Paul Polman is very well known as a, uh, um, as a true legend in, uh, in both in the area of sustainability, among sustainability scholars and also practitioners. Unilever had a very good and clear sustainability plan the last few years and it's a transparent company. It has a very good sustainability strategy. It focuses also uh, in internal environmental action. So Unilever will be one of the big names that I would say. In terms of alliances, um, um, not sure if I can come up with a company here in the UK, but there are environmental business networks that work together and develop synergies in order to achieve environmental goals. What I can say is that, um, I mean, the case here is and the question that we also asked earlier on about SMEs and we still have quite a few SMEs that are doing well in terms of green marketing. Okay, I'm conscious we're getting towards the hour, but I'm still going to keep going. Um, the, uh, the next one I want to ask you is about skills and, and education. So Paul is asking, do we have the necessary skills to ensure green marketing strategies are effectively implemented? So for example, a true circular economy starts with the design process and therefore does our current education and training system uh, deliver this? Yes, I think, um, <clears throat> I think we're getting better in this. Uh, and uh, to be honest and frankly speaking, I think that uh, a few years ago, um, that will be even the case for the marketing discipline. I mean, we've, we have seen that many, if we get the higher education industry, we've seen that many undergraduate degrees, marketing undergraduate degrees, didn't include CSR modules or sustainability modules uh, as core modules. And this is really important because when we educate the future business leaders and our beloved graduates uh, that would actually become managers in a few years, it's really important to inspire them in the cl in classroom. So I think we have been uh, we have made some progress the last few years, but still, then what is happening usually is that the organizations invest uh, in the environmental training of their people, and it depends on what organization you are working, to what extent you will be inspired to first adopt a sustainable lifestyle as a consumer. And second, to adopt um, an ethical, um, an ethical environmental thinking uh, about management. If that answers I, yeah, no, and, and uh, I'm really aware of time, and um, I'm going to ask you one last question. And it's be, be, being the, the host, I can ask you any one, and I really like the one from Tao Tao. So I'm going to read that one out in in a minute. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and just to encourage people that if you if I didn't answer your questions, ask your questions, or um, you want to pursue the conversation, then just just contact you know, Carlos from, sure. from do, do, do a search on him um, and, and you'll find him. Um, it was on his slides, I think. Um, so you can get in contact and ask more. So the last question um, is to expand the green market. Um, they think that customers should have a uh, the need for a green product or green lifestyle or a, a lifestyle. Challenging question. Do you think customers, consumers have a clear definition of sustainability in green products? So do you think they actually really know what, what is one when they see it? Or are they, yeah, I'll hand over to you for that last one. I agree. That's a very good question. The, the, my answer is no. 
still we have uh, we have seen uh, great progress the last few years compared to 2010 or so, and uh, it is the it is um, it is the responsibility of the companies to educate their consumers, to let them know how they can read, understand, and even buy a greener product from their competitors. It, 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 uh, it takes great um, courage for companies to do that, but it pays off. When you are transparent and when uh, you are not a greenwasher, but you are really mean that you are doing, you have uh, environmental sustainability programs and you have a green marketing strategy and you are transparent, then you need to educate your consumer and tell them that you are choosing this product for my company because I do this, this and this. Back in 2010, 2011, 2009, environmental certifications and um, eco-labeling was the only way to understand if a product was green or not. Mm. Uh, today we have web, we have internet, uh, we have sustainability reports that are accessible. So it's even easier, I think, um, for some of us to pick green products, but sometimes I even struggle. <laughs> Th thank you, thank you, Karos Papatas um, from the University of York um, Management School. It, it's, it's been great and I have put you under pressure on answering questions and um, some great answers and some really challenging questions from our, from our, um, our audience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you everyone for, uh, for uh, asking um, uh, these questions and please uh, um, do get in touch with me through email or LinkedIn and I will be happy to discuss and share ideas about this. Thank you so much for hosting, Peter. <laughs>